Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth Sankofa conversation entitled A Campus Roundtable for Reflections. Where do we go from here? My name is Ping An Addo, and I'm an associate professor of anthropology. I'm also a core faculty member in the Critical Ethnic and Community Studies Master's Program. I'm affiliated with the Asian American Studies Program and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Programs. I'm here to introduce this important panel. Um, I'm here to name what's been named, what's been intersected with, and what we are going to be really thinking about and asking you to help us talk about and talk to, anti-racism. And of course, as a campus and a group of scholars, students, activists, and human beings who suffer oppressions and work against them because of in, in an intersectional way, we are also going to think about things in an anti-sexist, anti-ableist, anti-classist way, issuing discrimination on people based on their sexual orientation, their national origin, their immigration status. Being anti-racist and health promoting go hand in hand. But without our focus on restorative justice, there's less likely to be the thing that we focus on when we think of health promoting that is healing involved. Thus, the combination of these visions and approaches of being anti-racist, becoming health promoting, and taking part in restorative justice, justice processes can be transformational if we take them on together. And these Sankofa conversations are just the beginning. We are just the beginning. We take with us the responsibility and hopefully the commitment to work together and to be transformed. Learning and working at this university, our purpose is necessarily steeped in transformation as a goal and a value, but to what ends? Transformation so we can be promoted, so we can get published, so we can gain a degree, earn more money at work, be distinguished in our community. If we focus on the utilitarian aspects of why we especially were brought to this place, UMass Boston, at this time and in this way to have these conversations with one another about these things, we will lose an aspect of our purpose and the meaning and the transformation we can each help to bring about. For some, our purpose will be to speak truth to power, be it at the university, given the oppressions we deal with every day, just to get the job done, just to earn the degree. For others, our purpose will be to hear, really hear, to listen, really listen, and to believe in the analyses of those speaking those truths to us. And then to dig deep and wide and use our systemic power to change specific structures at the institution and beyond, even if we have to buck trends in the academy. This means that there are, there are different roles for each of us, but the common ground will be our personal commitment to change and to being changed. Even for those of us who indeed are more woke, there is work to do. For example, as Professor Rosalind Negron said in an earlier Sankofa conversation, to understand the culture that we're all swimming in and to face it head on. We cannot just believe and hope we can't just talk the talk. We can't just walk the walk. We must understand the talk before we can walk talk. And we must do. Let's be doers, not workers. Let's commit to the walking that benefits us all, not just to the working that benefits the profit makers above us and around us. And as Ms. Kim Richard said in the previous Sankofa conversation, uh, she's from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. She remind us that we should be doers, not workers. At this time, time of COVID-19, the end of the second decade of the 21st century, when understanding talk is crucial, it's important that we remember that what has always matters, regardless of what the talk has been, is that our physical health matters, our mental health matters, to be free of bodily harm matters, but it is indeed the body that which can be harmed that is the thing that has us labeled, pigeonholed, oppressed, and sometimes vaulted above others because of the way that the body is interfaced with. 
Thus, when we say that Black lives matter, brown lives matter, indigenous lives matter, we have to think of the word life. Without health, life is, may not be worth living. Let's make tonight about the things that are worth living. On that note, and given my responsibility here tonight, I would like to just say good evening to our chancellor, chancellor Dr. Marcelo Suarez Orozco, a scholar of US immigration, a new beacon and a new beacon for the university. I want to recognize a recent book beacon moment of his that you may not all know about. I'm not sure when this took place, but it did look take place. If you look on your UMass Boston calendar under October 2020, you will see that the second Monday in October is now labeled Indigenous Peoples Day. Faculty and students in the Native American and Indigenous Studies program met with our chancellor in mid-September to introduce ourselves and to update him on efforts that we and others had been making around campus for years about changing the name of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day on the university calendar, correspondence, and shared expression. That is our talk. At that point, our chancellor listened, understood, and said he, could, he would see what would be done, could be done. He wasn't sure what or how quickly. Imagine our surprise when this weekend, my colleague, Dr. Maria John from the Department of History came upon the calendar and saw that the name of the holiday had been officially changed on the, for the university. The talk has been going on for years. And our chancellor, our new beacon, walked the talk. I look forward to hearing from you, Chancellor, on what else you have heard and will hear tonight from tonight's Sankofa conversation and the preceding ones, and also on what you are willing to commit to continue working on and walking on to change so that UMass Boston can be an anti-racist, health-promoting institution. Someone else involved in the work along with Dr. Maria John was Dr. Cedric Woods, the director of the Institute for New England Native American Studies and the director for the Critical Ethnic and Community Studies Master's Program. He is one of our speakers on this wonderful panel tonight. Another Ethnic Studies Institute director with us tonight is Dr. Lorna Rivera for the Gaston Institute. Dr. Kito Swan is here with us from the Trotter Institute. And Dr. Paul Watanabe is here from the Institute for Asian American Studies. Also with us on our panel are Ms. Adesua Igbeniweka, the Professional Staff Union's um, head for the Committee for Racial Equ Equity, CORE, Dr. Jamadari Kamara, my colleague from the Department of Africana Studies, Dr. Denise Patman, my colleague from the Curriculum and Instruction Department in the College of Education and Human Development, Ms. Tracy Beard, a graduate student from the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development, and Mr. Anthony Martin, a graduate student in the Critical Ethnic and Community Studies Program, a UMass Boston BA undergraduate and a gifted piano player. Our moderator, Dr. Elizabeth Sweet, whom we call Betsy. Um, I mentioned this because we have another Dr. Elizabeth Sweet on our campus. Dr. Betsy Sweet is an assistant professor of Africana Studies and Urban Planning and Community Development. And Dr. Sweet is going to be our moderator this evening. And so with my introduction and my welcome and my thanks for all of you for being here, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Sweet, um, who will take us into this wonderful evening. You will only hear my voice again tonight when I say 30 seconds to our speakers to remind them when their time is going to come up, is going to end. Um, but other than that, it's all Betsy and everyone else. So again, welcome, thank you. And I really look forward to this conversation. Blessings. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't want to forget our awesome colleague, Kito Swan, Dr. Kito Swan, who's in Africana Studies also, and he's on our panel as well. Um, again, my name, as um, uh, was mentioned, is Elizabeth L. Sweet, not Elizabeth S. Sweet, but everybody calls me Betsy, so I prefer Betsy. Um, and Koe, welcome, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Um, I really thank you, Pingang, for your amazing um, introduction to what our work is today and recuperating some of what has already gone on in the three previous conversations. And I'm very, very humbled and honored to be participating in this enormously important conversation, um, the fourth in the set of four. And we have so much more work to do and there are lots of other plans going on in the, the next semester. 
I also want to acknowledge my brothers and sisters of the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc who are continuing to be the caretakers of this land. My own Abenaki relatives have been in relations with the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc for millennia. And my acknowledgement is wrapped in a commitment to work hard for respect, reciprocity, responsibility, to be part of restoring what epistemicide has taken. My acknowledgement is not performative, but steeped in practice and action. And I have to say that I've heard so much that's resonated with me in these uh, previous three conversations. There have been many truths told, many questions asked, um, and many calls to action. I wanna share something that struck a deep chord with me. Dr. Parker in the first conversation stated that there was only one full black woman professor at UMB that had gone through the process at UMB. She said, we are told to wait. I had not thought about the word wait like that, but then I realized I too am waiting and waiting. I graduated 20 years ago with my PhD and I'm still waiting for tenure. And last summer, my dean and my chair wanted me to go up for tenure, but then I was told to wait again for another year. Waiting is the language that stalls us, that stalls processes of progress in eradicating the afterlife, my tip to Hartman, of colonialism, slavery, and genocide. So in this conversation, we're not gonna wait any longer. We need to collectively see and recognize the pain that Dr. Parker described and that Dr. Kruger Henney illustrated with the students' body maps. We need to get to the cured bodies. We need healing justice. That is why this evening we are going to develop our work plans, set our strategies, make commitments to hold ourselves accountable and responsible for creating a path of reciprocity, reparations, and restoration. To set the stage for that work, I want to repeat some of the ways that the previous conversations have set us up for this stage of our path to be an anti-racist, health promoting university in collaboration with communities. We need to put equity at the center, uh, center of gravity, as Dr. Crockett said. Dr. Davis in her motivational presentation talked about the three R's, but I think there are a lot more R's for us here that I heard in those conversations. Recognize, repair, radical, reimagine, reparations, responsibility, Re reject structures, radical imagination, reciprocity, relationality, radical healing, reject the carceral state, respect, reconciliation, reopen, reemerge, representation, and reflection. But there were also a couple of T's and L's. Truth telling, transcend the illusion of inclusion, take action thrive without becoming a function of racial neoliberal public education transformation. And finally, liberating liberation and love. And as we were told, justice is love practiced in public. So what we're gonna do in this panel today is we're gonna ask each of the panelists to briefly and I emphasize briefly, respond to in a round robin format to three questions. Um, and then after we get through that, we're gonna have a conversation where I hope we're really gonna be able to lay out our plans. And I am an urban planner at heart. So we are planning and we take action on our plans. So I'm, I'm really hoping that by the end of the night that that's where we're gonna be. And as uh, Ping An said, she's going to be the timekeeper. She's going to be cutting off people since she's tenured and I'm not. Um, and I also encourage everyone uh, on the panel to keep your own time. If you can set your clock for your two or three minutes, um, that would be great because it's a little bit easier if you have that and you can sort of see where you're at because we all love 
to sort of, this is such an emotional issue, I think, for most of us here on the panel that we could go on. Um, so without further ado, and we, um, we have a list, I have a list of um, who's going, and I think all the panelists do too, but I'll, I'll shout it out. Um, but the first question, and this is a two minute response, um, and we'd like to have all the panelists, and I'll go through the, the list of, I'll call people out, um, to identify what each panelist considers the most important issue raised. So um, the, so it is one, um, but maybe there's two, maybe there's three, but we really have two minutes for each of these. So try to be as specific about the one issue. And if you have to go for a little bit, that's cool. Um, but we're gonna start with Tracy. Hi, um, I think uh, it's really difficult for me to, to be the first person to go uh, with this, but um, what I really would like for us to, to center and to um, in this conversation is the material um, impact of systemic racism and institutional violence on our bodies and on our communities. Um, and I say this um, because having conversations with my fellow um, students who have had multiple racist incidents at UMass Boston um, and have them say through frustrated tears, I don't want to be black in this school. Mm -hmm. So I think that first we have to center this, the, the material impact. And then also we have to remind ourselves that although we have this history at UMass Boston, this um, commitment, this mission, um, we cannot um, be, um, we cannot um, say, to, say to ourselves that we are an anti-racist anti health promoting institution and still um, be committed to um, issues, uh, still be committed to anti-blackness, xenophobia and be anti-indigenous. Um, we have to excavate our relationship to power, to imperialism, to colonialism, to capitalism and heteropatriarchy. And I wanna make this very plain. We can't espouse to be health promoting a health promoting institution and place people, place profits over people. Um, we can't say that we're anti-racist and health promoting institution and remain committed to sexism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia. Um, and we can't claim to be an institution that is community focused with an urban mission, extracting knowledge from that community, excluding them from decision-making processes, and then displacing those same communities that we claim to serve um, through processes of gentrification um, in the name of development. Um, and so I wanna finally say that I really wanna thank my activist student scholars that have been on this campus that actually pushed this work to happen um, it is through your work and your commitment that this conversation is happening. And so I wanna encourage all of us to keep pushing. I know that this comes at a tremendous cost to you, um, to all of us during dealing with multiple pandemics. Great, thank you very much. So we have to still do some more truth telling, obviously, really making sure everybody knows all of those experiences are happening and then stop the exploitation. And that exploitation is happening on many levels. My friend, Denise, so good to see you. You're on mute, honey. It's my delight to be here this evening. Um, Thank you so much, Betsy, Pingan, Tracy. Um, as I think back and looked at some of the conversations, what really rang true for me was the notion of imagination. None of us, we have all not ever lived in an anti-racist community. No matter who you are, we've all experienced this. So we must imagine as Cedric imagined Indigenous Peoples Day and Ping On, imagination I'd like to ask all of us in the audience and throughout our institution to take a moment 
and imagine yourself what you might be doing differently if we decentered whiteness and white supremacy. We must imagine elusive anti-racist community development into existence. What is before us is huge. That is difficult, but absolutely necessary. So interrogate your imagination. I would even suggest reading, there's a new book out that's entitled Black Imagination. If you'd like to know what some of the things that I think about, people who look like me think about. It's by Marin, M-A-R-I-N. Keep an imagination journal. But us, I'm sorry? 15 seconds. Oh, oh my goodness. We, 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 we already represent mighty networks our departments, our classrooms, our homes. So we must root out racism at the core at these networks to achieve that space that's truly anti-racist. And to connect with what Tracy said, we must love into this existence. We must create and be mindful of emerging structures through our imaginations. I only have five seconds, so um, I will uh, simply say that this Sankofa series is the beginning of this collaborative inquiry action community. Uh, one of the things that was very uh, clear, there's a desire, a will to change, to work to become an anti-racist campus. Our students depend on us. Not one of us is expendable. We must do what it takes to prepare ourselves and our students to know that every life matters. In this academic setting, we must interrogate who and what we value, truly value, and embrace that finding in wonder. Thank you. You know, and that is really sort of blowing my mind, this idea that we have to imagine what it will be like to not be in, in a racist society because we're all in it. So we don't even know what it looks like not to be in there. So we do have to use our imagination. That is just blowing my mind right now. Okay, cool. Uh, Cedric. I want to uh, first and foremost express my gratitude for being part of this and the space that UMass Boston can become what we have seen glimpses of what it has been, but can be more in a consistent process going forward. I am cautiously optimistic that the impetus, the momentum here brought on by combined, conjoined pandemics of racism and disease, COVID-19, attacking the body politic in our physical bodies now, that this is not just a moment, but it, it will grow and become a movement here in this place. Mm -hmm. I have great gratitude for having you all here as people willing to work mm -hmm. and to labor mm -hmm. to make that happen. And one of the uh, elected officials at the last conversation and dialogue brought up the significance of UMass Boston, as well as my dear sister, who I rarely get to see these days, Yvette Modestine, about how UMass Boston creates space for conversations that can't or won't happen anyplace else. Mm -hmm. And that's what I aspire us to be. Thank you, Cedric. You're making water come to my eyes here. And, and the idea of needing to be optimistic, even cautiously optimistic, and to have some hope that we really do can, can seize this moment and really make changes is, is, I think, important for us to remember. And the gratitude, of course, is key as well. Okay, we're going to go to Lorena. 
I mean, Lorna, sorry, yeah. Lorna. Who, let me just tell you a little story. When I came for my job talk, Lorna wore some Frida Kahlo earrings for good luck and it worked. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you. I knew that we were going to be kindred spirits because she also had on Frida earrings. We're like, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you again for, um, for, for inviting me, for being a part of this. And thank you um, again for your words, uh, Cedric, because today was that 20 years of service um, for me, 20 years. Um, they don't count the two years that I was an adjunct. So 22 years really of service to UMass and it's been a you know it's been a journey um, as as um, you know I've witnessed really the university changing so much um, and I just wanted to again elevate a couple of points um, you know related to like really this question of you know we have to do what it takes right to make um, our students um, succeed and achieve their full potential but that also means really understanding who our students are. And really the way we have marketed our university and talked about ourselves, it's, it has really made some groups invisible. Um, for example, we don't brag about being an Anapizi institution. Um, we are on that cups of being a Hispanic serving institution. Um, but we don't sort of pride ourselves as well in terms of, um, you know, who our students are. Um, you know, I want to point out that in between 20, 2007 and 2017, Latino students grew 126%. They almost four times the growth of African American students and five times the growth of Asian American students. Um, so the growth of Latino students is the largest growth apart from international students. And we're seeing the decrease right in international students. Um, so really this, this, this growth in our students though, doesn't mean that they're succeeding. Um, and so they still have, Latino students have the lowest graduation rates. Um, on average, the Hispanic six-year graduation rate is 40%. For African-Americans, it's 42%. The African-American and, and Latino um, graduation rates for four years, 19% of first-time full-time freshmen that start in the cohort, only 19% graduate in four years. So these are really unacceptable, right? And what are we going to do about um, really supporting our students. Um, and again, this invisibility of the, ex the racist experiences that um, there's collective racial trauma on our campus. Um, you know, we're seeing how Latin Latinx have been racialized and that that racialization is linked to col colonialization, um, imperialism in the Americas. Um, linked to, again, the racism in our immigration policies, um, what we're witnessing at the border with the separation of, of children, um, the rape, the sterilization uh, of women. Um, you know, these are the, the history of displacement and destabilization that we as, as a country, right, our social policies are responsible for. And these are the students that are in our classes. Our, our population in Massachusetts um, has really grown with that Central American and South American population. We're not just Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Cubans. So part of what we also have to understand is, right, is, that, is that, that history of, of, of that, that, you know, that struggle of oppression and, and really, again, how are we going to support our students and, and our faculty and our staff that are experiencing, you know, this collective uh, racial trauma? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to, um, again, later, talk a little bit about the Gaston Institute. And, and we were founded specifically for this purpose, not because UMass Boston thought it was a good idea to have a Latino research center. It was founded by community by legislators, by an external 
constituency. And so we have that responsibility also to keep supporting our racial and ethnic institutes. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Great, thank you, Lorna. So what I'm taking, and I'm just gonna repeat the question again, um, is what identify um, what are the most important issues raised in, in the um, previous conversations. And, and from what you said, I'm, I'm feeling like it's, we have to really understand the context of our students and sort of linking to what Tracy said, like to understand the, the experiences on campus, not only what was what is out there in our community now policy in our in, in the world, but how that's colliding with what's happening on campus. And so we really have to be doing more truth telling and, and, and understanding who our students are. So again, the, the, the question is to really come up with the thing that you um, take away from the previous conversations that you want us to focus on. What issue has come up? Quito. Uh, Betsy, thank you so much. Um, for me, it's really about the concept of, of, of Sankofa itself, uh, and, and not simply through the the generalized context of go back and fetch. You know, it's a calm principle. Um, it's really important when we think of African diasporic experiences and the, the notion of returning to ourselves, our histories, for figuring out solutions to move forward. Uh, but it's also for me from the context of the movie Sankofa, which was directed and written by Hali Garima, um, amazing Ethiopian film producer from Howard University who I worked with for decades. And there's, there's a, a proverb in the film where one of the, the leaders of a maroon community in fight against slavery says, snake won't eat whatever in the belly of the frog. Snake won't eat whatever in the belly of the frog. And that's something that struck and stuck with me for years in the sense of, you know, when the snake consumes the frog, it has to digest whatever the frog is eating. Um, in other words, if, if we want to have conversations about racism, anti-racism, some of those conversations will be uncomfortable because if we're we have to really digest the nature, the experiences, the pain of the conversations. And so I truly appreciate the notion of imagination and truth telling because what I'm hearing is I'm imagining what would happen if we just told the truth? You know, usually <laughs> imagination, we, we think of it as taking us somewhere else. We would create these fanciful ideas from an external space, which is true. But at the same time, what if we imagined just, if we told the truth, what would these conversations be about, right? What would they talk about? And that's challenging because the truth can be very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. Um, so, so the notion of, for me, imagination, it's important to envision a brighter future, but we've been doing this work for decades. Uh, you know, I've, I've been thrilled to see my colleagues at UMass Boston having the most amazing ideas and work on the table of what they've been doing for decades. So we all know that this work is painful. It's not always comfortable. And for me, that's one of the most important things. If when we think about Sankofa, it's important that we think about our internal processes and the ways in which we could add to build a healthy university. But to do that, we have to be honest about the ways in which we've added to unhealthy practices of the university. So for me, it's a very internal discussion that we're in a new moment right now where you know, Black Lives Matter, we no longer, right? We no longer put certain conversations aside for the sake of you know, fake performance of unity for white supremacy. That, that day is over. Um, so in a moment where we should be, we should feel free to speak against patriarchy. Uh, exploitation within our own communities. Um, as someone who has studied decolonization, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a truth telling process that forces us to also look within. And so, for me, that's one of the most important things. It's, it's the ability or the the notion of Sankofa to actually tell the truth, our rigid narratives, how we get from A to B, who's in the room, who's not in the room. All those things matter. What if we simply just told the truth. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That is key. We can't go anywhere until we really understand what's going on. This is a repeated uh, theme here. Thank you very much. Adusuat, what? I know I said that wrong. I am sorry. Adesua. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Adesua Igbinereka, mm -hmm. a proud UMass Boston alum, two degrees. <laughs> 
And most of my family went here, so I'm super excited and honored to be here with this wonderful panel today. I would like to share what I have been, um, what I took away from the conversations that we've been having throughout the Sankofa campus conversation. We've been asked to re-envision our reality, reject structural racism, systems that oppress people. We have heard a call for inclusive curriculum, increased minority representation in staff and faculty, a campus climate that is inclusive for all, cultural healing, mental health and emotional health, and accountability for the processes that exist and the changes that is to come. The work will be difficult, challenges and pushback we abound, but the time is now. Imagine if we just live and thrive. It's not too much to ask for. I am a UMass Boston alum. As I mentioned before, most of my family members are graduates of this university. And we went here because it was affordable. I put my heart into what I do because I relate with my students. I also want my students to see themselves in place of service so their aspiration can grow. As an alum and staff, I am very emotional and grateful when students email me and say they see me as a black woman professional that they look up to. Mm -hmm. And I want to see myself in the people in leadership so that I can believe that I also can be in those positions. I look forward to sharing ideas with all of us as a campus community and the staff at UMass Boston are not expendable. Great, I think that was a great sort of um, list of things that we have heard through these conversations and we do, we, they were so rich. I was trying to take notes and I just have pages and pages of notes and there are just so many wonderful things that have come out of that, so thank you. Um, Paul. Well, I'm just thinking just in terms of today's discussion, there's been two ideas that have come forth and that's about truth and imagination. And I think about uh, Phyllis Wheatley, whose uh, who's building is, is, is one of my offices is, is uh, named after. And, I'll, and the words that she says is talking about people like her who are living under slavery said, she feeds on truths and unimagined things. And the, the unimagined thing was ironic, right? Of course, they were, she, she was talking about things that the, that, the, that, the, that the dominant society would not even think about. And that's what she used the idea of unimagined things, not imagined things. And she feeds on truths and unimagined things. And I think that in some ways summarizes part of the conversation we've had today. And the Sankofa discussions that have taken place so far, they really have been fo focused on an accounting and accounting is critical because you have to have an honest accounting before you have the discussion about responses that we hope we're gonna have for the rest of this evening today. And I've been around a long time for the actual accounting. I've been around for 43 years at UMass Boston. So I've seen a lot of accounting, a lot of stops, a lot of starts, a lot of advancements and a lot of setbacks. And, I, and there's a couple lessons that I wanna draw from that. And I think they're reflected in some of the conversations. And first of all, if you wanna have diversity in faculty, staff and students, much of that must be, it just doesn't happen. Much of it is tied to programs and purposes and values. So programs, let me give you an example. We once had a college called the College of Public and Community Service at UMass Boston. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you look at the mosaic that we've had here in the last uh, four sessions, people like Jim Adari, people like Cuff Ferguson, people like Lorna. I, I think Lorna came through CPCS as well. If you look at part of the diversity that you see of the faces here, part of them are associated with that college, which is no longer. So you, you ask, why have we become a university that maybe even has fewer black faculty than we had before? And part of that is because we shut down a program that spoke to students and diversity and the community that we talked about. A college of co a public and community service. What a wonderful ideal for UMass Boston. And it is really where our students are. If you think of students of color, and where they work, the data tells you that black people, for example, in the United States, their principal sources of employment are in the, in the public sector, in government positions and nonprofit sector. That's where the work is and that's where the involvement is, that's where the students are. And yet we, we, we jettison programs like that. And secondly, in terms of values and norms and policies, let me say something about that. 
I've gone through a period of time and UMass Boston has always tried to be something else for somebody has a fancy idea that we should be the, the next Northeastern or the next uh, BU or the next BC rather than to be what UMass Boston has always been. And that is a institution that serves a particular core of individuals. And I've always sta stated, people say, well, look, Paul, the number of students that are gonna be college age is going down. But the point I always make is, you gotta look at who the people are that are coming despite that. And if you look at Massachusetts, for example, the source of growth are immigrants. The source of growth are immigrants of color to Massachusetts. And that's our niche, that's our future, that's our hope. And the, the extent to which we don't understand that, that we understand that UMass Boston's hope is not in, in sort of appealing to the common middle-class student who lives out in the suburbs and wants to be attracted to UMass Boston by dorms. And I think we should stop building dorms at UMass Boston. And that in some ways that we should recognize that our particular niche and purpose at UMass Boston always has been and always should be to focus on people who are people of color, people of low income, people of all colors, people who are older students wanting to try to get back and try to get a chance back and work with their families and now see that an opportunity to, to pursue their education. Those are the essential purposes and that will add to the diversity of the UMass Boston students, faculty and staff. It's programs, policies and values that will do so, not just wanting to make it happen. Thank you, Paul. You know, the, the competency-based education that was the root of CPCS is something I think we need to really try to get back to. Mm -hmm. And at the School for the Environment, we are really trying to work on that, but it needs to be a campus-wide and I appreciate the, the linking to Lorna's point about we need to know who our students are. And I think to some extent we do, but we need to embrace that and be proud of that and um, really see those values that you're talking about. So thank you very much. Tony. Hello, I am, uh, man, I'm happy, happy to be here. You guys, you guys are so amazing. And, and uh, this has been, been so so rich. Um, what I wanted to share, Doctor Doctor Kamara said in uh, the first first um, COFA com conversations, he said we must take the step of acknowledging that we're ill, that there is an illness in this country that has affected our campus, and we cannot heal until we acknowledge first first the sickness and then take steps together. We must begin to see with new eyes and we must hear and listen with open ears. I believe these uh, code for conversations are a step in the right direction towards, towards healing. And, and I think, think as, think as uh, you know, Professor Wat Watanabe was saying, until, until we're, we're real, until we're honest. And I think also with, with what Professor Keto said, uh, you know, have, have some uncomfortable conversations we're not going to move forward, and you know, if we continue to to uh, brush brush things under the under the rug and not and not deal with it, you know, nothing nothing will change. So, I will give whatever seconds back. Thank you. I appreciate your pulling some stuff together for us here. It really is what we need to do. Jim Jari, you're up. Thank you very much, Betsy. The comments that have been made, I think, uh, have really touched upon the range of ideas and conversations that have come forward. And thank you, Tracy, for, for laying out such the uh, breadth for us to begin to lift up some of these ideas. I cannot um, leave this without addressing some of the questions that Paul raised, because one of the things that was most clear to me was the question of, well, given the conversation, what's the plan? What is our master plan? Mm -hmm. This is the challenge that Fania Davis laid to us. What's yeah. the master plan? How do we materialize our imagination? Make this concrete and real. Our imagination leads us to a sense of, of uh, commitment to our values. And I agree wholeheartedly with you, Paul. So much of what I've heard over these conversations has taken me back to what brought me here, to the values of CPCS. 
And let's be clear, as Quito was saying, let's talk truth. CPCS was crushed. Mm -hmm. CPS was crushed by the colonial domination of other, of other uh, colleges that sought to take from CPCS the selected departments, which they saw as profit centers and put them into CLA or into McCormick. Let's talk real talk. The idea of Sankofa has emerged out of an, a, a, a treatise, a work done by Dr. Marimba Ani. And that talks not just about going back to fetch the ideas and the culture and the response, those things that have hurt us, but what happened in the process. It is called the Ma'afa, that which destroyed us. Some people is, as she refers to it, in the context of, of the experience of people of African descent, some people refer to that as the middle passage. But she is referring much more broadly to the pain and the trauma of what happened in the transition from that culture that was left to where we are now. But what is the objective? The objective is called ma'at. That is to seek harmony and balance. But as we are doing our self-interrogation, that balance is to look both within and without. We have to have that hard discussion internally in our campus, but we are actors in a community. That's time. Thank you. Thank you, Janavari. Yeah, this is, um, it really is important, all of these links to our path. We can't do one without the other. We need to really have that truth telling and, and looking at ourselves, but also linking to our communities, which we are nothing without the community, right? And, and CPCS, although I was not here, I knew Marie Kennedy very well. And um, many of the, my colleagues at SFB come from CPCS. So it is really something we need to go back and pull out and really engage with the very important ways that CPCS was anti-racist in its being. Um, finally, Chancellor, Suarez Rosco, please share with us what is your sort of most important issue that you've come away with from the conversations? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. First, I want to express my gratitude for this opportunity. I am grateful to our colleagues for all our endeavors to engineer and to bring to life these essential conversations. I am happy and grateful to acknowledge the colleagues, the panel, panelists here with uh, us this evening, as well as in the previous Sankofa conversations. I am very grateful and I want to acknowledge the dedication to our common purpose of all our colleagues here today. I wanna to name Dr. Keith Jones, I want to name Dr. Tony van der Meer for their work, for their endeavors. I'm so grateful to all of you for inviting me. So much wisdom, so much truth, so much beauty in what my colleagues articulated. Dr. Ado reminded us we need to hear, we need to listen, we need to believe. At the root of belief is the idea of another word that our colleagues invoked with rigor and with heart, and that's the idea of imagination. I believe we are in a time of grave hope, hopelessness, and I echo here the words of the great, the brilliant, the eternal Algerian writer who argued, where there is no hope, we need to invent it. Mm -hmm. He articulated that 
in his own times, looking at other horrors and other hopelessness, we must invent hope. This is what I've learned, and if I may, I'll be a pithy and concise from the previous conversations. We as a nation face concurrent, lethal pandemics. The COVID-19 wicked pandemic leaving death and toll suffering above all in our most underserved communities. This reminds us and the wisdom with which my colleague Cedric framed this took my breath away. It reminds us of the nexus between structural racism, health, and wellness. Structural racism is a health crisis. It is a crisis that is currently, currently, sorry, is my video on? It says that my video is not on. Oh, sorry, sorry, is my video on? Yes. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, as um, the, the pandemic is uh, aligning with the structures of racism, of xenophobia, of sexism, homophobia, transphobia, in vicious synergies and complex intersections that are now, and here I use the metaphor of my colleague Cedric, they are killing the body politic of the nation. They are killing the body politic of the nation. Therefore, it is fundamental that we engineer the vehicles to disrupt the growing inequality, most profoundly shaping the life experiences, the identities, opportunities of our miner miner mineralized, racialized communities, including our black, indigenous, Latinx, hermanos, hermanas, hermanes, our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. And the cry, and the cry to commit, to engineer new structures of opportunity, new structures of hope via urgently needed new policies that need to be at once humane, smart, sustainable, and life enhancing. I'll leave you with a quote from the great, great Franz Vanon. Quote, what matters today is not so much to know the world, but to change it. Amen. That's from his classic, Black Skin, White Masks. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Um, so I'm hearing in this first um, round of questions that we need to really concentrate on our truth telling. We need to figure out processes and um, you know, real activities that we engage with that continue our truth telling. We need to figure out a way to make it an integral part ongoing. It's not that we do it and it's done. We have to figure out ongoing sustainable ways to make sure our truths are being told. And imagination keeps coming up as well. And, you know, CPCS is that egg that we have that we can go back to and bring it to the future, bring it to the now. Um, and so I, I'm gonna sort of, I'm getting some notes here and I know other people are also taking notes. So we're gonna have, our plan really does need to be linked with all of the comments that everybody is making today. So we're gonna move on to our second question, our second round. And um, it says three minutes, but we're a little bit over time. So I'm gonna say two minutes. And so the second um, question, is um, going to is um, what are 
concrete proposals. So we've had our the issues that we've talked about and we've talked about truth and we've talked about imagination and sort of really concrete things that are we, we need to get to that. Um, how do we do our truth telling? What are the concrete ways and ideas for us moving um, to an anti-racist and health promoting public research in institution that is linked and embedded in um, communities. So again, we wanna, I'm gonna do two minutes and it's what are concrete proposals that you have? And we're gonna, I think it's the same order. So Tracy, do you wanna start? Yes, um, since we only have like a short amount of time, um, I'm gonna kind of quote here um, a pastor of mine, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. And he would say something like this, you can't teach what you don't know and you can't lead where you won't go. So we need to develop institutional wide curriculum that focuses on dismantling racism and promotes well-being and health. What does that look like? It requires students of all majors to take two courses, one in Africana studies and another in critical ethnic studies. It means revamping our curriculum across all departments. My comrade, uh, Celine Voyard, Dr. Kruger Henney, and Dr. Thompson discuss ways to decol decolonize our curricula across the institution. And we already have talked about that. It also requires that all administrators, faculty, staff participate in undoing racism workshops um, hosted by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Dr. Parker talked about the need for truth and reconciliation. Um, we need to address the gap in POC women of color, but especially black women in tenured uh, felt full professor positions. And Dr. Parker, again talked about this and we have to be intentional in our search processes in retaining and promoting black women faculty and as a person is going into the academy this is vital um, for us and then also creating a healthy community by refocusing and funding uh, things that we've had in the past that benefited our community um, and that also means bringing in the community as a part of the decision-making processes that we have, and then uh, cultivating a worker-centered, student-centered environment that recognizes and respects all people from different backgrounds. So a staff person should not be treated less than a tenured faculty person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are all essential to the development uh, and the growth of this institution. Thank you. Um, we have, we're taking notes, other people are. That's a great list of things. Um, yeah, curriculum, key curriculum. And there was just a, a workshop last week on curriculum, decolonizing the curriculum. And we need to have more of those and more processes for working together to do that. Cause it's not, it's slowly doing it by itself. And it's much more fun collectively. Okay. Denise, what are your Thank you. concrete, we want concrete things here. So this is good, we're getting them. Uh, well, I, I think that Tracy has definitely uh, identified many of the things that I was thinking about, but first and foremost, um, I want everybody in their imagination journals to commit to recognizing and rewarding the power and brilliance that Black women bring to the table at UMass Boston. From this point forward, I will repeat that. Recognition and reward of the power and brilliance that Black women bring to the table at UMass Boston. That's a concrete number one. Next, I agree totally with Tracy around curriculum issues, shining light on promising and emerging practices to decolonize our syllabi. CIT has moved into that space. OFD 
is the Office of Faculty Development is also uh, looking at um, issues of that nature. But in both instances, those structures need support. He seconds. Oh, why is it me? <laughs> Just you. Support is absolutely necessary for those structures to really be the support systems that they need to be for faculty, for staff, for us all. The last thing that I will talk about is um, the need to create safe spaces for courageous conversations and transdisciplinary collaboration, where we can begin to perform deep work together. And this calls to mind the ethnic studies curriculum work for Boston Public School teachers that I am doing with Professor Quito Swan about Black Boston through the Trotter Institute and our Kanala collaboratives. I'm sure that uh, this will come up later in conversation since I've run out of time, but there needs to be value added to that, um, that this is not simply service, that this is what the mission of our anti-racist institution is working toward. I'll stop there. Thank you. I mean, that is key. We really need to think about the transdisciplinary approach because the silos are what keep us apart. We need to come together. So I really appreciate that. Cedric. Thank you all so much. I will be brief. Uh, my first point is to uh, frequently people from liberal arts backgrounds don't like numbers a lot, but I really want to challenge uh, that assertion and approach and thought process and to really think about a budget as a moral document. It identifies and articulates our priorities. It defines who and what we are uh, and what I think should be reflected in that as part of our values and priorities, which my dear colleagues who have already articulated is uh, academia as a collaborative versus an extractive endeavor uh, in terms of working with communities uh, and building up uh, these community partnerships and collaborations grounded in reciprocity and approach. Uh, and we all gain as a result of that. Uh, and again, an emphasis on preparing students to support, engage, and work and benefit their communities in which they live as part of the path to healing and anti-racism. We, we have to be there if we're serious about it. And if we're aligned in those ways, the last thing is we can actually have a shared legislative agenda to make public education public again. We can actually have students, faculty, staff, and administration going to our elected officials who allocate resources and place the same challenge that here also, this budget should be a moral document reflecting your commitment to educating residents and citizens of the Commonwealth. Great, thank you for saying the word budget and linking it to being a moral document. And something that's on my list is, can we do a participatory budget process in the university? Can we have everyone on the university have a hand in creating that moral document. Um, and there's lots of models that urban planners use to do this um, across the country. So I'd be happy to help get that set up if that's possible. Um, who's next, Lorna? Um, yeah, so on the issue of budget, um, again, I agree with that. And you know, one of the things that was um, heartbreaking was for me and many of us on the call was the closure of the Early Learning Center on our campus. I mean, we're talking about health promoting university and the first thing that we did under our budget first, you know, was to close the children's set. I just like, an unbelievable, um, mostly employing women of color, um, children in the community, in the Harbor Point community, my son, 
was part of the early learning center. So we have to do something about if we're health promoting, then taking care of our children and many of our, our, our students, our parents, our staff. Um, again, it was such a transformative, wonderful place mm -hmm. to have my son you know, being taught by my students in, in many cases with the community. So number one, let's, I just can't believe we don't have affordable um, childcare for our families um, and people that work at our university and our students. So um, definitely agree as well. There are racial equity planning tools for budgeting and decisions that are being used in many municipalities, including Boston. So we could, you know, including a participatory approach, but more deeply a racial equity analysis where all every stage of the budget planning process is, is considering questions around, um, you know, who, who are, how are these decisions being made and what are the, you know, the consequences, et cetera. And I'm happy to share those materials. Also, I wanna, okay, okay. I also wanna point out again that part of the CPCS loss was the loss of a Latino studies, the only Latino studies full-time faculty line. We still do not have a Latino studies department, a Latino studies major, and we still do not even have a single professor dedicated uh, fully to teaching Latino studies. Uh, so again, curriculum um, that needs to be um, implemented as well. Thank you. Uh, Quito. Uh, thank, thank you, Betsy. And I'm sure many of us, and I, I don't want to speak for my colleagues on the call, but I'm sure many of us can speak to the work that they're already doing uh, and we're doing uh, before the tragic incidents of the summer. Uh, and since then, in terms of concrete ideas, uh, for me, I think the university needs a radical research agenda. We need that, a radical research agenda. Uh, we should be talking of decolonizing our curricula. That's really important. We should also be focused on decolonizing the research agendas, um, decolonizing, once again, our own issues, our mentally decolonizing ourselves and thinking about decolonizing our relationships to one another as colleagues, as students, um, decolonizing our departments, Office of Advancement, the colleges, and imagining what that looks like. For example, what would it look like to decolonize Africana studies or English or other departments across campus? I think that's important work. So it's curricula, it's a research agenda, and it's about, for me, creating spaces of inclusive intellectual reciprocity as opposed to spaces that materially benefit only a few individuals. Uh, and this is the type of work that we're trying to do at the trial. Since February, we released two research policy briefs, one on COVID-19's impact on black communities in Boston, one on police, police brutality in Boston where we analyze um, police stops, um, publicly, public accessible data, the police stops, full webinars this summer, one how to make UMass Boston anti-racist campus, which was uh, you know, really blessed to have the chancellor's presence as well as others on this call like Tracy. Um, we had a webinar about COVID-19 and the African diaspora in the moment of COVID-19, faculty research groups for black faculty. Uh, I myself released a book about environmental justice of black internationalism. I just finished a practically an eight month project with Bermuda government looking into historical land grabs on the island. And, and I'm really excited about this because in the public tribunal, I presented evidence that might actually bring reparations um, to black communities in Bermuda who had the land taken. Myself and Cedric have talked about this quite a bit. And I'm really excited about the support um, and the energy that's been brought to the Trotter from folks like Denise, um, Gifty, Deborah, Azura, Layla, uh, Elisa, Shirley, Yvonne. We're, we're building and cultivating a space around our research projects that crowd across faculty, staff, graduate students to really actively engage the kind of research projects that we're trying to do. But the Trotter, as other institutes, we all need more support. The university needs a radical agenda around research uh, that's just as important. Um, if it fuels our curricula and just as much as we need to have classes and um, workshops around anti-racism, 
Black faculty need resources as well. Black faculty need support, um, research support. You know, those things really matter to me. And as someone who, in my positionality as a Black person born in a Caribbean colony, a Bermuda, which is still a colony, for me, colonialism and decolonization is not just an abstract idea. It's a lived daily reality. Uh, I, I know what the stakes are. And so it really warms my heart when Lorna speaks about the relationship with Puerto Rico and colonialism. These are the kind of work we can think, we can thinking about locally, nationally, and globally, and UMass's position uh, as a leader of diversity. Um, and so those are some of the concrete things that we've done. So I, I would briefly say, um, I have an open door policy. If you're interested in being involved in any other Trotters projects, whether you're a graduate student, faculty member, uh, staff member, administrator, please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really um, appreciate the idea of a radical research agenda that's focused on decolonizing our research. Um, and that is something we do have to really institutionalize and the Trotter obviously is doing that but we, we can um, really make it across campus that that's something that we're gonna really commit to. Uh, Paul. Oh, wait, sorry. Edusua. My list is bad here. Concrete, we want concrete ideas. Yes, we talked about talking about the truth. Let's talk about some truth, right? In the city of Boston, 55% of the community members are people of color. At UMass Boston, it's less than 30%. Black, Hispanic, Asian, and American staff are underrepresented at UMass Boston. 60% of our students are students of color. We teach students to come, get their education, go out into the world, and achieve if they do not see themselves in the people who lead and serve them, what are we teaching them? What does the corporate world look like? What does government look like? At UMass Boston, we lose a huge amount, a large amount of staff of color every year. And we cannot ac ac uh, account for why that is the case. I'm going to guess that most of us know that structural racism plays a part. It is not okay for you to bring people here, make their lives miserable, and they have to leave. We have departments that cycle people of color. Why? A pay gap persists, and that pay gap is further compounded by a gender gap for women of color. The last time the pay scale for professional staff union members was increased was 2007. Many of us have to work two jobs to survive. And we talk about emotional health, mental health. How do you do that working two jobs as a staff of UMass Boston? 30 seconds. I would, en I would encourage the leadership to commit to creating an impactful change, not lip service or good intention alone. Diversify the representation on campus, show us the plan, increase representation in administrative staff body and leadership. Transparency in data collection of the hiring and retention, as well as the firing and loss of staff of color on campus. Great, thank you. That is so important and it doesn't get enough tension, I think, um, in a lot of this kind of work. So I appreciate all of that. We do need to um, really focus on those numbers because that's what's gonna give us the information we need to act. Um, so thank you. Paul. Well, I have a long and varied list, but I'm glad other people have already given some of their ideas. So first of all, in the Africana Studies course requirement, I am definitely in favor of it. And my one advice to the people who teach this class is to think not only in terms of the African-American and white dichotomy, but think about the positioning of other people of color, Asian Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, and other as you teach this course. While it's Africana Studies, we're talking about race in America. 
Secondly, and, and Lorna and others have talked about the need to support the racial and ethnic institutes. And this is not just for me as somebody who's ahead of one. And I really appreciate what Cedric said, which is to say the budget is a moral document. So think about all of the things that people talk about, about community and about, and about research, and about bringing students into projects and so forth. And then think about the role that they played. And then think about just a couple of years ago when we get a very stark message from the higher ups that says, you must have, you will, in the next four years, you must be able to pay for every single thing that you do at your institute from down right down to paying for paper clips. That is a document that raised questions about the moral sanctity and the support of, of these efforts at UMass Boston, and they contributed to the health. If you think about this as health, think about the staff that we have at our institutes. And if you think about the staff, it's a particular staff. It's all staff of color, by the way. And if you think about that, the, the, think about the staff that reads this and says that your, their position is going to get reduced down to nothing within four years unless you can raise uh, your own salary or, or somebody can raise it for you. That, that, that's part of, of, of the impact of this. Some other suggestions, number one, and, and one of them is I think it's gonna get me into trouble, but when it comes to the policies, I think the president's office is usually wrong. That's my view. Now they're, they're not always wrong. They selected Marcello as our, as, our, as our chancellor, but even that was something that our campus really rigged the thing and they did it effectively. Gene Rhodes and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the committee really only gave the president one choice. And that was, a, and that was part of the, actually the ingenuity of our campus in trying to prevent the president's office from taking a choice that was gonna be against our interest. I think in case after case, my experience has been that the president's office is not, has the best interest of our campus and these norms and values that we're talking about in mind. And I know that's gonna get me in trouble, but I, I, I think that's the norm. And we have to understand we're fighting a lot of forces, but one of them is down there on, on, uh, on uh, Ash, uh, Ashburton Place, I think in, in Boston, we have to understand that. And there's case after case after case of that. 30 seconds. Finally, let me raise one, uh, a couple, one, uh, one or two other points. And the other point is, in all of this, I think we've got to think about our white colleagues on this campus as allies in this. Black lives matter, and they really do, but black lives matter to all, uh, lots of other people. The black lives matter, and what happens to our black brothers and sisters is going to have an impact on other people of color within the United States, and it's going to have an impact on our white brothers and sisters as well. And there are people within this campus who want to support us, but I think many people, our, our white brothers and sisters, are not quite sure what to do on this on this point. They don't know whether to try to put forward and whether to act or whether to stand back or what to do. And I think we need to welcome them. I need to think we have to understand that they're allies and that we, that we have to respond to those who really do want to support these efforts to to move towards racial justice for all of us. And I th and I think we got to be aware of that. And finally, let me just make this suggestion and that all of us should get around the campus. We should always get around. We should get out of our silos that's been talked about. Part of the reason why I'm such a champion of CPCS, I remember within two weeks of coming to the campus, I heard this about this thing called CPCS and I was curious. So I went down to Park Square and actually talked and tried to learn something about this other college. I was in the College of Arts and Sciences at the time. I wasn't a member of CPS, but I was curious because I was concerned about the community and the one places to go is to talk to other people and other college and other colleagues. And I think that that sort of thing is the kind of thing that we can branch out and learn about our institution. And we want to talk about our students. Part of the way we can learn about our students is go to plays and go to performances and go to athletic events and go to where the students are and visit them and see them in there and, and get out of our little we're a part of a university, a very rich experience here at the university where students and faculty and staff can interact in a variety of different ways and across departmental lines. And part of that is something that I think most of us got to be willing to engage in. So get around, talk to people, and I think it's going to add to this desire of us to expand our, our understanding. And it's going to add to our health and our racial understanding as well. And, and it really does add, add to your help to go see a play or a concert by our students. Great, thank Thanks, you Paul. very much. Tony. Yes, that's a hard, hard act to follow. <laughs> well, think concretely and you can repeat. Yes, <laughs> I am, I, I am. Um, 
you know, Pro Professor Jones and I was talking and, and he said to me, he said, opportunity without support is not support. Opportunity without support is not support. I think we have to do, do things to, to produce all manner of intervention, you know, including structural intervention, curriculum and intervention and, and concrete proposals. And, and I think, you know, structural racism impacts, impacts the well-being of our, of our communities. And absolutely, I'm, I mean, it, you know, contributes to a bad, bad health and other, other things. And, and I have a solution that's, that's just one, one piece, piece of, this, of this giant puzzle. We are, we are bringing, bringing my brother's keeper to campus as a chapter because, because we have to do something to, to um, support our black, black and brown men, you, you know, and although, you know, I, I mean, we need to, to uh, support for the women, women, Asians, LGBTQ, and I think all people of color, but this is a group, you know, on campus that is that's oftentimes neglected. You know, we hear very, very little about it. I think Dr. Lorna, actually shared some some uh, statistics earlier but but this is you know this is one thing that you know that I'm looking looking to do with with the help of a lot of faculty and a lot of other people to to actually help bring bring some some change and like like I said it's a it's a small piece in this in this big puzzle that you know that I think we're all able to to contribute to, and I think the the Sankofa conversations are absolutely essential in this. You know, and I'm also grateful. Thirty for, seconds, Tony. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm grateful for for Professor Kido Kido Swan for for giving us a place for whenever we're back on campus. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and that's really important. And I have in my mind, because I'm a planner, um, a map of all of our work and linking the different places that we need to really focus on. And some are bigger and some are smaller, but they're all connected. And, and seeing it as a puzzle, as you described, is really important. And we want to make sure we have all the pieces together. So thank you for that very much. Chancellor Marcelo. Oh, Jamadari. Oh, Jamadari, sorry, Jamadari. Thank you, Betsy. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, I want to thank uh, Cedric uh, as I open these comments because you've allowed me to be very uh, specific and clear. If you show me your budget, I'll tell you your value. Mm -hmm. We have talked for now several months We've talked about our values. I want to see the budget. This process has been put together and we have thanked those who have worked so diligently to do this, all of whom have done so on a voluntary basis. The two core people who have been behind this, neither are tenured, neither have been paid for this. This has been voluntary work put together out of their energy. If we are going to have a long-term commitment to following through on these ideals and envision and materializing our imagination, we have to put resources behind this. Secondly, we have to structure accountability into the process. The transformation of our culture and our institution, as we have articulated this, will not happen without a structure of accountability linked to the budget. And that begins from the chancellor's office to the provost, the deans, and everyone else who is implementing this. We must structure in accountability. Thirdly, the training and, and teaching is what we do. We've spoken to the need for the uh, uh, required course. We're beginning this in the spring semester. Students who are interested can sign up for a homecoming course, an extremely interesting course that will be designed by reading collectively a novel and working together. Africana Studies 280, the independent study course, that can be signed up. You can get credit 
immediately for that. That's concrete and material. In the fall of uh, 21, there will be, we hope, institutionalized, required courses from a, a, a cluster of courses as well as the Africana Studies intro course that everyone will be able to take. Training, thirdly, training is required for everyone. Whether you are of African descent, you're black, you're, you're, you're white, everyone has been impacted by the institutionalization and the structure of oppression in this society. That internalization of racial superiority also has impacted the internalization of our own oppression. We all need to work through this. The design and the creation of this new culture, this new environment, we all must participate in that and transform ourselves. But the transformation of our own community is impacting the broader community in which we live. The hallmark of the next decade on the peninsula, unfortunately, is not just the transformation of UMass Boston. The Dorchester Bay City will, will create a new identity for our peninsula. We're collectively involved in that. And the community is saying very clearly, it does not want to have the seaport in Dorchester. We are part of that. What is our voice? How are we are helping the community in articulating a nature of community benefits? How are we involved in training? What is the nature of our health programs linked to the vision of this new city? How are we articulating that and manifesting our material, the materialization of our imaginations concretely on our land, in our community? The transformation begins within each of us as individuals. Yes, the microaggressions that become manifest are a reflection of the macroaggression of the institutionalization of that racial oppression that we are all party to. That's time. Thank you, Chairman Dari. Thank you. Okay. Chancellor Marcelo. Concrete things. We want really concrete things here. I am very mindful of the time. I will be very pithy and on point. I submit to you, this is our time to fly. And I echo now the eternal words of Toni Morrison when she asked us, quote, you want to fly? You've got to give up the shit that weighs you down, end of quote. This is our time to fly. This is our time to live sustainable. This is at our time to live humanely to love our land, to love our spirits, to love each other, a word that one of our colleagues began our conversation with, love. This is our time to reject hate, to reject all of that is life denying in the structures of our economy and in our society. I st stand behind you. I stand behind our collective project <coughs> and share vision for making UMass Boston a beacon of an anti-racist, health promoting, life enhancing education. As my colleague who taught me on this matter, Professor Warnabi, remind me, if we are to be a university of and for the city, if we are to be the university as our charter proclaims, 
that takes the struggle to where the struggle is. If we are to be a university of and for our times, given our times, if we are not doing the work of anti-racism, we are not doing our job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very, very much. Thank you. So we have um, about 25 minutes left and we have one more question and we actually don't have too many questions, uh, one more question for you all. And we don't really have too many questions in the um, Q&A box. So what um, we'd like to do is to try to get a takeaway or two from each of you. So what is it that you um, are taking away from the four conversations together? And it could be a word, it could be a few words, whatever you want, but just what, it, what are you feeling? What are the emotions and sensations of, of taking away? What, it, what is going through you right now um, as you're sort of thinking about those three previous conversations and then this conversations? Um, so Tracy, what's your takeaway? Hey, my takeaway, so um, the first thing is um, we need, um, to break the silos. Um, second, uh, Dr. Cedric Woods saying that a budget is a moral document. And, um, and I kind of want to echo that where we invest is where our values lie. And so that, that is, I think, a major takeaway. And then also, how do we continue to make these ideas, our imaginations, concrete? So what, what are we going to do after this um, to, to make this go? And so um, urging everyone to actually think about the concrete things that we are going to put in place after, this converse, after these conversations that will continue to move us forward. Great, thank you very much. Denise, takeaways, you gotta un Unmute yourself there. I've got you, thank you. A few things um, are quite poignant to me. The first is the need to create a space for healing. Many students, many faculty, staff are outraged. The rage burns. It burns and it needs to burn so that the last sneaky vestiges of hatred is ravaged. And it's only then that one is able to make for a healthier and richer place to imagine the narratives that we are going to share and create. These are serious practices that need to be done so that the university must, it's part of what Dr. Swan talked about in truth telling, the rage is there and uh, it must be uh, dealt with. The, the second um, important piece for me is um, opportunity. And as the uh, brilliant um, East Indian, uh, writer Arundhati Roy just let this pandemic be our portal so that we might dare to reflect and plan forward uh, what we need to do with innovation. And as Ade Sua said, putting our hearts in what, what we do. 30 seconds, Denise. That's it. Great. Um, Cedric, takeaways. I am just so very hopeful at this point in time. Uh, I know that I am engaged in various projects with practically everyone on this panel in one degree or another. Uh, <laughs> and I'm so very grateful for that. And to Keto's point, if we've already done this, 
having to lean into and fight against headwinds, driving to destroy us. Uh, what more could we accomplish, Denise? I can imagine what it could be like uh, if we actually had support and were pulling in the same direction to make uh, this the place that we dream it to be, uh, to what we truly can be. And I look forward to doing that work with all of you. Great, thank you very much. Lorna. Yeah, so this morning, um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley with the conference, the New England Women's Conference, Women's Policy Conference uh, said, the, those closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And I really think that that's that leadership of how we're going to be anti-racist university. We need to keep that in mind. Those closest to the pain should be closest to the power in the decision-making. I also think we need to shift our culture of scarcity. We have been starved for so long that we believe, right, that we, we have to fight for these crumbs. Uh, so we have incredible cultural wealth on our campus and, um, and this innovation and this, I mean, look at the people on this call, right? If you just harness this, right? Um, then we, we can become an anti-racist uh, university if we believe in the power of the, the, these folks right here. Uh, so I just, again, we're having to shift um, this culture of scarcity, we, we gotta get we gotta get past that. There is enough. There's enough cultural wealth to address the needs that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Keto, takeaways. Uh, yes, Lorna, I totally agree. And I think that's the part about, you know, decolonizing our, our minds. I think some of us imagine that we have to operate from scarcity. Uh, so we imagine if someone's doing something productive as opposed to supporting that, it's, oh, what about me? You know, and that, that's, we only have that understanding or that approach if it's from a position of scarcity. Uh, but there's room for us. Um, I'm not sure who said it, but there's so much work that needs to be done. And I'm a fan and student of Walter Rodney who talked about how one of our first steps is engaging you know, the power issues within our space. We all have different roles. Uh, one person does not need to do everything or to try to be everything. For me, one takeaway is, you know, I'm ready to get back to the work of, of manifesting our imaginations. Um, I would be amiss if, if I didn't mention um, two other um, research assistants who are working with us, Maria and Hannah. Uh, we're about to release the trial review next year. That's real work. Uh, but I think that's how you create we're trying to create the mediums so that the work of UMass, of our faculty, our students, they can be harnessed, do productions like that. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been doing a number of projects around police brutality and police brutality organizing in Boston. We're looking forward to releasing those, that kind of data next semester. Uh, back to the issue of the, you know, the research agenda, the radical research agenda, we need to be off the glide path. As my colleagues at the other ethnic institutes have mentioned, the pressure of it is unnecessary. Um, it's, it's challenging. Each of us are doing work around ethnic studies and implementation of ethnic studies in the Boston public school system. As Denise mentioned, I'm looking forward to getting back to that work. Um, we're about to launch these classes in the Boston public school system next semester. And to Cedric's point, you know, looking at what we're doing with lack of resources, imagining if we had the resources and harnessing the social resources, the, the, the knowledge resources, the institutional memory that a Kamara and a Paul can bring us, um, the new visions of new faculty who have new ways of thinking of things, uh, the digital world, uh, the, the intersections, breaking down the gender dynamics. Um, I'm excited about the space that, the potential. And so for me, the takeaway is, being excited about getting back to the work. Um, because if you're doing the work, you know, this is what, what, else, do you, what else do we do? Uh, one thing that's really important for us is the notion of a racial justice fellow housed at the Trotter Institute. Uh, that's not a concrete idea. That's a, that's a, that's a position that, uh, that's a drum that I've been beating for some time. 
uh, the engagement of Africana studies at a graduate level, a graduate program facilitated via the Travel Institute is something that I think is really important and could be transformative uh, for the city and for Massachusetts. It's been about 50 years, I believe, for Africana studies as a department. Uh, if the time's not now, uh, then when is it? So for me, my, my takeaway once again is, is getting back to actually manifesting our imagination um, with folks who are constantly doing, doing the work. And I wanna say thank you um, for everyone who took the time out to be on this call. I know we're all terribly, terribly busy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adesua? Thank you. This feels so different for me because I'm used to speaking up on behalf of our students. And today I'm speaking up on behalf of staff because in many universities, there is students, faculty, you count 10 seconds, and then you remember those people who do work as staff. And so as staff members, we wanna be seen, we wanna be recognized, we wanna be respected. And as an anti-racist campus, we also want the campus to listen to us. So when we say things like we suffer racism, do not tell us that the perpetrators did not mean it and we should move on without re ad um, addressing the issues and without concrete apology. And tonight I am grateful to be here as part of the Committee for Racial Equity. So I wanna say thank you to the members who do good work on that committee and also for the union for also giving us this opportunity to be together and to talk about um, what we're working on and the good work that we're working on. The data that I shared today was put together by the core committee and we would like for the university to support us in creating this data that can be shared with the entire university community. Thank you. Great, great, thank you very much. Um, it is really important for us to be in this all together and to have somebody say that your experience is not your experience is so demoralizing. And I personally have experienced this a lot over the years in the academy. So uh, we need to stop doing that across the board. Um, uh, Paul. Well, I'm thinking that the first time I came to UMass Boston 42 years ago was for my interview and I bought a 25 cent subway token, believe it or not, it was 25 cents back then and rode across the river to, to my interview here at UMass Boston. So now about 22,000 trips back and forth from the campus later, here I am. And, and the one thing I, I really feel is a sense of gratitude and it's reflected here today. It's been great, you know, much of my, you know, I sort of think of myself as sort of cranky. I'm sort of a complainer a bit, but I'm, I'm a complainer who wants to build upon that as well. But I only have a sense of gratitude to be so happy to have been this and call this UMass Boston my home. If you think about these wonderful people here and you go back to Jemadari, who's he, he's an older colleague, but he's not the oldest colleague I've had. And I think of some of the new exciting people I've had, there's no place I would rather be. There's no place I'd rather be involved in the struggle. And it's a struggle and, and we're not gonna achieve everything we want but I'd rather be engaged in the struggle with these people on this campus than any university. I, when I was in college, I decided I wanted to be on a college campus because I was going to school in the 60s and the 70s where, where, where college campuses seemed to be the center of things. But I realized I didn't want to be on any campus. I was so happy that I was on this campus and spent my career here. And think of the wonderful people, the old timers, the Cuff Fergusons and the so forth, but think of the wonderful colleagues I get to spend most of my days with people like Cedric and Lorna and Quito and what a great, wonderful thing that is to be able to draw from their intellect and, 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 their, and their passion and learn from all these people. And I learned from everybody on this mosaic. I want to continue doing so. And the struggle is really where the battle is. And I think, you know, as they say, a man's reach must, a person's reach must exceed their grasp or what's a heaven for. So some way we may never reach heaven but the process of wanting to get there is really what it's all about. And, I, and I'm in, happy to be engaged in it with all of you. Thank you so much. I keep uh, hearing about hope and excitement and it makes me think about the word in Spanish, ganas. And it's sort of a will, the ganas that you have 
to do this work and I'm feeling a lot of ganas here. And so I'm very excited to, to sort of be a part of that. And it is the energy between us, I think, and across the campus that's gonna carry us um, through here. Um, Jimidari. Oh no, Tony, sorry, Tony. My eyes. Yeah, what I'm gonna say, you say as a, as a student, using using your word hope you know i'm hopeful that that uh, the conversations will actually materialize into um, actions that actually result in in what we're talking about you know academics uh, you know it, it's a place where where we get to ask questions and the questions Questions may never get answered. We may never ever answer any of the questions, but we're great at asking questions. And so I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that, that the conversations here will materialize and to, to you know, an institution that, that is health promoting and that, that, is, that is helping to undo racism and that's actually making a difference. So that's my takeaway. Great, thank you so much. It feels good to have that kind of takeaways. Um, Jimmy Dari. The curve of rising expectation that I feel and optimism mm -hmm. uh, has been reinforced by the comments of all of you that we've shared today. And those that I've heard over the last uh, months in this continuing conversation, but it's reinforced by the leadership that I think that we have on this campus, a, a leader we've had on this call, who's listened very carefully to this entire conversation and this set of conversations, who has made certain appointments in the few months that he has been here, that has made a statement in saying, I hear you, I see you, I believe in what you are articulating. And it has led to this curve of rising expectations, but I'm old enough to be cautious. And I look forward to this opportunity that we all have in our institutions, in our departments. I wish concretely, in fact, that we, we're hiring collectively in a different manner. I wish in fact we had a cohort hire. And the basis of the cohort of all of the faculty being hired for 21 and 22 academic years was being addressed based upon their value. Not whether you're a chemist or an accountant or in psychology, that is necessary, but that's insufficient. I want to know what your values are. I want to know if you're coming here to build an anti-racist, health-promoting institution. No matter what discipline from which you might have emerged, how do we break down our barriers if not at the center of what we are about is our values? Our budget will tell us that. But also if we reconstruct the way we think about doing business, the way we think seconds. about who we are, what is our structural relationship to our community that surround us and within which we are engaged, where we live. We are in the process of becoming these ideals. None of us is there. None of us has the, the answer. All of us are struggling within ourselves for this transformation, within our units, within our departments in which we get isolated from one another. But producing these kinds of horizontal linkages premised upon our values and our interest in working together, struggling together, that's how we do it. But we have to hire that way as well. We have to revision, that's part of this revision, this remaking, this reshaping and making material the idealism and the expectations that we hold. And I am holding them very high now. 
they're increasing. And I appreciate the leadership that we have in our institution and look forward to uh, us structuring collectively accountability for ourselves as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chancellor Marcelo. Takeaways. Thank you. To close, here are my takeaways. First, in the spirit of Sankofa, I look back and reflect upon where our colleague, Dr. Ado, got us started. I heard, I listen, and I believe. Betsy, I'll quote you. Con muchas ganas y con mucho gusto. I am happy to now call for open nominations, including self-nominations from our entire campus community to constitute a brand new restorative justice commission made of diverse individuals seeking racial, ethnic, diversity, diversity of discipline and representation across students, staff, and faculty. I am happy to announce now and an email communication to the entire community will follow that said commission will be co-chair by Professor Joseph N. Cooper and Dr. Georgiana Melendez. The charge of the committee will be to propose ways to develop and facilitate processes for becoming a leading anti-racist health promoting public research university through specific policies, concrete programming, training, curricular interventions, and institutional practices. Concrete immediate efforts should include and prioritize. Numero uno, recommend a plan and develop mechanisms for an ongoing evaluation of the racial climate of our campus. Recommend pragmatic, actionable, sustainable plans for providing anti-racism education programming and training on campus and in the local community based on the findings of ongoing evaluations. Seek to identify and engage appropriate shared governance processes for addressing areas of improvement in policy and practice in accordance to standard faculty governance mechanisms following codified customary practice. Identify, strengthen, create anti-racist academic and co-curricular programming work closely with the academic leadership of the university and following said governance, shared governance mechanisms to examine, suggest, support models that value contributions to equity, diversity, and inclusion in teaching, scholarship, and service. Work closely with non-academic department units to examine and support actionable, concrete programming to support models valuing contributions to equity, diversity, and inclusion for our staff for their evaluations for their work moving forward. Examine and study and suggest health promoting anti-racist enhancements to our general education requirements. Thank you for the opportunity to hear, to listen, and thank you for making me believe. Muchas, muchas gracias. 
De nada, de nada. We really appreciate, um, I say we meaning everybody on campus, we appreciate your leadership and we appreciate um, our work together, our coming together, our hope, our ganas, our excitement to make this actually happen. We have to do what Denise has suggested and really put that imagination to work. We need to do the truth telling that Quito and Cedric and Tracy and others have said needs to happen. We need to really include staff in a much more integral way than I think has happened thus far. Um, and, and we have so much work, but I am feeling optimistic and I'm probably old enough, but maybe not smart enough to be cautious as Jimidari is. Um, but I'm feeling juiced. I'm feeling excited about the opportunities. And I've, I've been here, I keep saying this for 10 minutes because I've only, this is my year and a half anniversary coming up here. Um, but I feel like I found my people, right? I feel like this university is my people and I'm very excited to be able to participate in this process going forward and the energy I'm getting from everyone here and the questions and the chat and everything it's really um, it's very powerful and I appreciate everyone's contributions and we have a lot to do and we will do it I am I am optimistic Thank you so much. I appreciate all your time and everybody who's been watching and listening and uh, contributing to this uh, very important um, final conversation in this, you know, Sankofa series. And, and we have a lot more things coming up. Thank you very much.